So moving on, I, we wanted to cover a couple points here, a couple topics that have been very important uh, recently in the precious metal markets. Um, I, I suppose beginning, we could touch on emerging markets and uh, what's going on there. Uh, I know that in the last decade, emerging markets have acquired $14 trillion in uh, debt, uh, in U.S. dollar denominated debt. And um, so that's obviously been playing on the markets over the last months, you know, last year or so. Obviously, emerging markets currencies are having trouble. And uh, so I suppose you probably have been doing research on it, too. So let's uh, let's go ahead and hear some of your thoughts on what you've been seeing. Oh, yeah, this, this is fascinating to me. You know, most of, of my viewers of the people watching this video, uh, this is somewhat removed from their own life. They're from the U.S., you know, Canada, Australia, from from Europe or something like that. And so they, they haven't experienced this inflation, this depreciation of their currency. But it's fascinating to me to see uh, currency like Argentina. I think year to date they've lost um, uh, almost half of its value. Right. Or, or Turkey, you know, to, to think that their currency could lose. 20 30 percent of value in, in in a span of like oh, a week you know that's insane to me mm -hmm. and i think that's just something that a lot of of you know americans or, or westerners just haven't experienced you know yet um but but beyond that just looking at the markets um this is something i started to cover you know a while back probably back in i don't know june or late spring of this year talking about emerging markets and and how there is more pain to come um essentially each of these individual countries, whether we're talking about Argentina, Brazil, certainly Turkey, uh, if you want to throw China in the mix there as an emerging market, sure, um, they all have their own individual economic problems. They certainly have their own political issues. Take a look at, at a place like Turkey or, or, or Brazil. right? They have their own issues. But I don't think it's a coincidence that, that all of these countries are undergoing a currency crisis simultaneously. You know, maybe the, I think the currency crisis, if anything, is magnifying their, their political issues. Um, and, and, and basically, uh, we have to look elsewhere for, for why is this happening? And so really what, I, what I've been talking about for a while now, and I've actually been referring to it lately as what's going on in emerging markets right now is actually a, it could be described as a U.S., sovereign debt crisis and and that's you know it's been a little facetious because we're not dealing with it the, the whole debt ceiling debate that hasn't nobody's been talking about that for a long time now but but this is something that was pointed out um earlier this year by i, I think it was the head of the reserve bank of india um a guy by the name of rajit patel he, he was talking about how the u.s both the government and the federal reserve um their policies are, are really what's hurting emerging markets OK, uh, basically what you have is in these emerging markets, you have an expensive dollar. OK, um, I describe it as you, know, you talked about all the debt that they have right now. Uh, the way that I try and relate this to my viewers is, you know, think about for a second here. If you took out, let's say a thousand dollar loan. OK, and let's just pick an easy number, five percent interest rate on that. OK, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how long you're paying off uh, in a year, three years, whatever. OK, let's imagine now that you have that thousand dollars of debt at five percent interest. But inflation in your currency is at, you know, 10 percent, 20 percent, 100 percent, whatever, you know, sure, you, you want to pay off your debt, but but ideally you'd wait as long as possible to pay it off because uh, the, the, the purchasing power, the actual value of that loan is, is going to go down and down as well as the currency depreciates. And, and that's probably your best bet as long as your, your, your salary, your income is, is moving up in line with inflation. Mm -hmm. um, the opposite is happening right now in a lot of these these emerging market currencies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, take a country like Turkey. Something like 90% of their corporate debt is in foreign currencies, primarily the US dollar and, and the euro. That's a huge problem mm -hmm. when all of a sudden your debt in, in terms of, of you know euros or, or whatever or dollars hasn't really gone up but in terms of lira it's it's gone up you know 30 percent in, in like a one or two week period uh, that's a huge problem mm -hmm. okay because they're, they're doing business in their country in the lira that's how they're getting their income so so that's really where this this problem has come from and so um basically i, I see this dollar strength in these countries and i think more accurately an expensive dollar to lend bring this back to what I was talking about earlier with the Federal Reserve and government, I think it's, I think that it's a result of some of their policies, right. most notably their, their quantitative tightening and, and then the U S government, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, just because it's what they do, but also because of the Trump tax cuts issuing a larger than expected amount of bonds. So that soaks up a ton of dollars. 
it, it creates a, a, I guess, a dollar shortage, not in the sense that they can't get dollars, but but they're more expensive. Mm-hmm. And and that's really what's been hurting these these countries. And so, you know, we, we have to ask ourselves, you know, when, when is this emerging market crisis going to end? And, and sure, they all have their own political and economic issues. But but as as a whole, you know, I don't see this ending anytime soon. Right. Not, not until the Fed uh, goes goes back into to QE mode again. Or at least until they stop quantitative tightening, uh, and that's really the, the only way out I see for for emerging markets right now. Um, and inevitably, you know, this will continue to spread from emerging market. Emer- we're already seeing this morning; it's spreading to to Indonesia, to India. I mean, it, it already has, but but the headlines are out there now. Eventually, it's going to you know the next one on the list is going to be you know Australia or mm-hmm. or the European Union and eventually the United States and so you know right. it's only a matter of time it's 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 been on the horizon for a long time but uh in the meantime I would be surprised if we continue to see the uh the dollar strengthen you know because because of uh I guess flight away from those foreign currencies and and their markets now in my experience I mean I in 2003 uh I I actually lived in Argentina for about uh 8 months or so and you know that was right after they you know in the 1990s they had pegged their currency the argentine peso one to one with the us dollar and uh that wasn't going to work because uh they kept you know their debt kept increasing so eventually they had an overnight devaluation in uh, 2001 to 2002 their peso went from one to one to one to four um and by the time i got there it was like one to mid threes and um so my experience of just seeing that firsthand, what that looks like on the ground, it really shook me. And uh, it, it basically led me to where I'm sitting today doing this interview because I saw it happen there and I see the setting up of it happening in the first world. Um, although people don't think it could ever happen, they think that just because the US dollar is a reserve currency and we have the financial plumbing that this could never happen in our country. But uh, um, I, I think it's 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 very probable in our lifetime that we may end up seeing some type of crisis with currencies. So hence my being in this interview with you. Um, the other thing about these countries is, you know, really wealthy people who live in say Brazil, Russia, Argentina, Turkey, they, uh, they typically will hold some of the local currency, of course, through transactions in their local, uh, economies. But if they have any wealth, they typically will, um, you know, they'll hedge it by owning us dollars or euros, um, and you know, basically assets that are that are uh, contrary to their local currencies, and in Turkey especially, they'll own gold, for instance. Um, you know, obviously the people that live in those countries buy gold in in uh, heavy fashion. So it's just a, a counterpoint in the term of you know, obviously the local people are hurting, uh, but you can bet that the local wealthy people are uh, are hedged, uh, certainly hedged against their local currency doing this because. Uh, all these countries have had this happen before. This is a regular occurrence, it seems, uh, sadly, in a lot of these countries. Yeah, yeah, and you know, to add to that, you're talking about Argentina being at a uh, uh, the Argentine peso being a, something like a four to one. Um, at the beginning of this year, it was around twenty to one, and and actually yesterday it briefly topped uh, forty to one. Right. So, so that that just you know goes to show just how how quickly these things can spiral out of control. But but yeah, you're right about those about these uh, these countries that that have have dealt with um not just economic problems i mean we've had those in the u.s but but real currency problems uh very unstable currencies um you're right and and i think a lot of times their their governments uh try very hard to to discourage that uh, i think later on this interview we're going to be talking about india but but india uh, their, their government um I think it despises the fact that that so much of their population choose to put chooses to put their wealth uh into things like real estate, but also precious metals. I mean, they have tried very hard to discourage uh, investment in in gold in particular, mm-hmm. uh, put, putting various regulations or tariffs or whatever on, on, on gold imports. And, uh, you know, as, as maybe, maybe you're, you're about to talk about this right now, but but a lot of, of those uh, individuals have switched to silver yeah, <laughs> as a yeah. whole. Yeah, before we get into the topic of India, I do want to touch base real quickly on a, a tweet I saw earlier this week that still has to do with the U.S. dollar strengthening versus emerging markets. Uh, I don't know if our interview, if our listeners out there know of Raul Paul. He is an, a co-founder of uh, Real Vision TV, which is a, a really excellent uh, 
website for, you know, I'm not a member of it. I'm still kind of using their free stuff for the moment, but eventually <laughs> I am going to bite the bullet and probably uh, get a, a subscription because their long, their long form videos are usually with some of the top people in finance and uh, they're usually really long, like one hour. So you get an in-depth view of what people are thinking in the world. Uh, he tweeted out something. It's, it's a chart that I'll put in this video that people can look at, but it, it basically, you know, it's a little complex when you first look at it, but it's it's measuring the DXY, which is basically the U.S. dollar versus other major currencies like the euro, the yen, et cetera. Um, so the white line in the chart is the DXY and it's going up. Uh, and obviously it's been going up pretty much since 2011. Um, obviously gold and silver have been pretty much going down since 2011. So it's kind of the inverse relationship between precious metals and the U.S. dollar. Uh, the other, the orange line is the emerging markets and it's inversed. So when it's going up the orange line, that means emerging market currencies are going down in value versus the US dollar. And the one point about the chart is the gap, the gap that you see in 2013 to 2014, that usually the causation is what he's alluding to is the causation is when that gap happens, you then have the dollar strengthening and emerging market currencies blowing out. Again, we have another gap here in 2017, 2018, which is formed. And, you know, the basically he's insinuating that it's real possible that by the end of this year into 2019, the dollar will continue to strengthen. And so that's just a forewarned for anyone out there who's buying precious metals. You can expect lower prices potentially in the fall and early 2019, possibly if this chart plays out like he's alluding to. So all I'm telling you is that twelve hundred dollar gold, fourteen forty silver may not be the lows. Maybe keep some powder dry if you're out there, you know, positioning in precious metals. Yeah, yeah, you, you make a great point there uh, looking at this chart. I mean, it's. I, I, I certainly don't think that the situation is going to be the emerging markets uh, that they that they move up to to you know what I mean it's going to be the dollar I think in uh, move, moving up to, to catch um, catch up with with the decline in emerging uh, market currencies because as I said you know if we're looking at the the underlying cause of this as a whole for the emerging markets it, last time I checked the fed's still on the path to tightening mm -hmm. um they're, they're still far away that they haven't even hinted at at uh loosening their policy anytime soon it, it's going to take a i think a, a cat an event mm -hmm. to to cause the fed to to change that policy and and right. you know maybe that'll help you know throw, throw a life preserver to the emerging markets at that point but but it's going to take something major happening and and you know then then we can expect uh, silver and gold to move up but but you're right you know the dollar index uh, yeah, it, um, I, I wonder sometimes if even it, it should be stronger than what it is right now, just mm -hmm. because, you know, as you said, the DXY index, it's, uh, it's the Euro, the yen, I think the pound, it's, it's so outdated. I think I have the Swedish Krona in there as well, but, uh, mm -hmm. but I think it just doesn't really capture just how weak some of these emerging market currencies are. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, you're right. You know, the, the next big catalyst I see is, is, uh, well, the Fed, you know, reversing their policy in response to some sort of a crisis. Right. For, yeah. For anyone looking for precious metals to revert, you, 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 like you said, you're probably looking at a black swan event and then the Fed changing course. And then, you know, you'll start to see financial assets, um, you know, remarket to market and probably precious metals will probably zoom based on what the Fed does. Um, so moving on, we, the... Um, uh, you, you did a video earlier this week that was posted on Silver Dockers about India. And uh, I suppose, you know, you could give some highlights as to what you were talking about in that video to our listeners. Yeah. So, I mean, the basically the gist of it is, is that, you know, most of the, the West, the United States, Europe, whatever you want to consider the West these days, we have definitely cut back on, on our purchases of, of silver as an investment. You look at the U.S. mint figures for for 2018; uh, they're they're pretty pitiful compared to say 2015, 2016, and that's kind of the theme here in the West. Uh, but but India has has been doing quite the opposite with these low prices, um, along with with a, a weakening um, Indian rupee. They've been buying a lot of silver. You know, mm -hmm. as of as of June, so so halfway through the year, I think it is June. Um, they're on pace to account for basically a, a quarter of worldwide silver you know demand or supply you know they're roughly the same around a billion ounces so they're on pace for like uh, a quarter of a billion ounces that they're planning on buying this year and, and sure you know india um 
they're they're a a, a big uh, I guess manufacturing economy. They whether it's whether it's solar panels for for domestic or, or international projects, uh, or electronics uh, factories, etc. You know, they, they they build a lot of stuff. You know, not a, not unlike China, mm -hmm. but you know, as I as I kind of alluded to earlier, you know, they're also a country that that has uh, a, a they definitely are drawn to to precious metals as, as an investment and, and they've been buying a lot and I don't think it's a coincidence that that they're buying while in, in US dollar terms at least silver is very cheap and and certainly while their own currency is depreciating as you said earlier uh, the, the wealthy basically uh, fleeing to or storing their wealth in some sort of a, a safe haven asset yeah it's not even just the wealthy I mean you're talking about farmers do this like literally really poor people um, what they do is when they get local currency, they just go and get bullion and they hold the bullion. And then when they need to refinance, they use the bullion for the financing. So it, it goes from the ultra high wealthy to even the lowest peasants that a lot of them still buy gold. And if they can, you know, if they can't afford gold, a lot of them obviously have been buying silver. Now, some of the charts I sent you earlier, um, just to give some context, you, you mentioned they are on pace to acquire about a quarter of all the silver that's been mined this year. 250 million ounces is the pace that they're on. One of the charts I sent you um, shows, you know, silver versus Indian rupees on a long-term basis, ever since the fiat currency system has been in place. So basically 1970 to 2018. I'll put these in the video so you can see what we're discussing. But there's a strong correlation here. When you look at the price uh, in the local currency, the Indian rupee of silver versus their silver imports, what you see is um, people will negate from buying when the price starts to go up, uh, when it gets to peaks um, on the chart. And then when it goes down, uh, <clears throat> local, <clears throat> local, silver, uh, local silver buyers will buy heavily. And right now the rupee uh, versus silver is at a, a pretty low point, starting to lower downward. And so that's why you see such heavy buying. Uh, a lot of these people, they, they're pretty similar to our, our own customers at SD Bullion, where they, they use price dips as a way to increase their position or to dollar cost average down their overall price point that they got into the, the precious metals with. And so the one chart I sent you that I think is probably the most important because a lot of people... You know, they talk about J.P. Morgan and their comic supply. And, you know, obviously, since the spring of 2011, they went from having zero ounces in their comics warehouse that got rushed into being in existence up to now. There's over 145 million ounces of silver. And that is a time span that's, uh, I don't know, seven years, roughly. And then you look over at Indian silver imports this year. The data that I'm showing you is uh, it's through June of 2018. Um, so if you just crunch down as far as, you know, the speed at which they've gotten to 3,839 tons this year through June, if you, if you break out a calculator and do the math, essentially by this time, we're in August, the end of August, uh, they should have more, they have imported more silver likely than JP Morgan has acquired in that comics vault over seven year time frame. So in a half year, India has imported more and obviously you know, people who are listening, we all know that J.P. Morgan is literally right next to the price discovery mechanism in the COMEX. Obviously, we know that they have a lot of influence as to what the price of silver is going to be. All I'm saying is that the physical flow uh, is very, very strong to the east, especially this year um, in just India alone. And the amount that they're buying is blowing out the amount that J.P. Morgan has acquired over seven years in their transparent COMEX vault. So... Yeah, yeah, and you know, I had a, uh, I had a uh, Ted Butler actually on my channel yesterday. The, mm -hmm. the interview is just, you know, just prior to, to us doing this, and uh, you know, his his take on it is that J P Morgan, I think he puts a number at like uh, seven hundred fifty million ounces that they potentially could have, and and nobody knows for sure. Right. Uh, but it doesn't matter. Uh, like you said, you know, India, <laughs> their imports dwarf that, right? Mm -hmm. um, even just this year, if they're on pace for. They're, they're on pace for a third of that, and, and that's if J.P. Morgan actually has that much. And, and you're right. I mean, the flow of physical is to the east. What for silver certainly to India, for gold, you know, to China. I, I had um, it's a uh, Lewis from from his channel Snoggled. I had him on a while back, and, and I asked him, you know, how much how much gold does China really have? Because we have, you know, the numbers that people really talk about are the uh, reserves 
that are, are listed by the People's Bank of China, their, their central bank, and and you know they 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 rose there for a while. They haven't really risen for a while now, and it's it's a fair amount of gold that they have. But mm-hmm. but you know as he kind of talked about is is that you know in reality uh, China they they produce quite a bit of gold. They mine quite a bit of gold. The they most the most in the world uh, year on yeah. year ever since the early 2010s. Yeah, every year. Yeah, yeah. They they mine a ton of gold. They mm-hmm. don't export it, and additionally, they import a ton of gold. So, like, where's this all going? And, and he, I think he put the number at something like uh, twenty thousand tons that they have between uh, the People's Bank of China, which is the most public one, but then also things like sovereign wealth funds, um, or or maybe the the ultra wealthy that that could very easily have that gold uh, uh, confiscated or, in, in an economy, or in, in in state banks, of course, too. Or state banks, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's a huge amount of gold, mm-hmm. uh, 20,000 tons. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, the flow of metals is, is definitely to the east. And, and it's, it, I, I think they're going to make, make a lot of, of um, otherwise bright investors look, look very foolish for, for, you know, throwing in the towel on silver uh, when, when they, you know, the, those that are investing in physical are, are building their position uh, yeah. more than ever. Yeah, for the most part, you're talking about just the mainstream Western investor who simply gets told about GLD or SLV and gets shown a spot price here and there. They have no idea about what physical flows are happening. They, they're not told that stuff typically on Bloomberg. And if they are, they're going to get told the official reserves. They're not going to get told about what's been happening since 2008 as far as underneath the... Uh, the spectrum of uh, you know mainstream finance. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and and, and the question that you know we have to ask ourselves is like, well, how is this going to change things in the future? Like, how much is is India and and China and, and the East as a whole, Russia as well? How much are they going to benefit from buying that silver and gold? I mean, in dollar terms today, it's not a ton. It's not worth a huge. You know, you you look at yearly silver uh, supply coming onto the market. You know, a billion ounces. Uh, multiply that by the by the current price here. You know, 15 billion, maybe 15 billion dollars, uh, and, and India is importing a quarter of that. That's a pretty small amount, um, but it's it's going to help them out quite a bit in the future, considering uh, you know how much uh, I guess fiat is going to go down, and, and more importantly, how much silver and gold will uh, go up in the future. Right, those precious metals. I mean, it's virtually impossible to destroy them, so they're going to be somewhere, obviously. So uh, you know, fiat currencies eventually go down to zero that's just the history of them and that's basically by design they end up going to worthlessness but precious metals will always be around and like you said india you know, they're importing heavily in silver and obviously in gold they they're probably pretty similar in terms of china they probably have about 20 to twenty-five thousand tons amongst their private citizenry and like you alluded to earlier the government is it's pathetic every time they try and monetize the Indian population and have them lend their gold to the banks in return for some type of scheme that they always throw out. Nobody buys it and it always fails. It's happened ever since I've been in this industry. I've seen them try this like four times and it fails, you know, it fails every time. And the, the citizens, they just don't trust their banking system. They know that their banking system is broke. That's basically why they demonetized the thousand rupee note was to try and get more depositors to put their cash in their bankrupt banking system to make it look more you know more solvent than it probably is uh so you know india will continue to to try and go down that route they're going to continue to go down the route of well we're going to move to a cashless society well great your citizens are still going to have precious metals and you can try and outlaw that but they're still going to have it and i don't see that stopping you can try and outlaw it all you want but people underneath in the gray markets are going to continue to use precious metals no matter what the law says. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, yeah, you know, it, it, I, it doesn't, I'm not a fan of a cashless society, even if I'm not a fan of fiat in the first place, I'm not a fan of a cashless society. But if, if you're looking for a country in which it makes sense, you know, look to a place like, like a Scandinavian country or something like that. But, but India, you know, where, where they primarily use cash and, and precious metals and, and, and all of that, it's, it, it's ridiculous. It's, mm-hmm. and it's, uh, and it's, you know, again, you have to ask yourselves if, if that's what the government is pushing towards. If they don't want you to own that, maybe it's as simple as saying, well, if they don't want me to own it, maybe I maybe I should buy some. <laughs> yeah, exactly.